Nvidia says that the GDDR5 supply is running out, and in accordance with that, the company is refreshing some of its active GDDR5 products with GDDR6 to keep them going. This isn't a common occurrence, but it does happen when there's a brewing switchover between two memory generations. We also see this happen for other SMDs, or even thermal pads, when supply of one dries up and a new supply has to be sourced for an active SKU. That's why most manufacturers don't define the individual components that are on their PCBs. In this instance, GDDR6 has potential to influence performance in a major, potentially positive direction, but Nvidia's reference GPU clocks for the GTX 1650G6 have also been adjusted downward. This might negate some of the impact, and so for both power consumption and for game performance reasons, we're going to be looking at the GDDR5 and GDDR6 versions of the 1650 today, including a clock-for-clock -clock comparison on the GPU core. Before that, this video is brought to you by Gigabyte Aorus RTX 2080 Ti Extreme. The RTX 2080 Ti Extreme is built with a triple axial cooling solution and ready for anyone interested in intermediate GPU overclocking, although it's also up for gaming out of the box. The Gigabyte 2080 Ti can reach the higher performance range required to play games at frame rates at and beyond 144 FPS, coupled particularly well with games like Call of Duty Warzone, Rainbow Six Siege, and other competitive FPSs. Gigabyte's Extreme is built to be a looker for system builders going for extra visual flair. Learn more at the link in the description below. This content's going to be really simple. We're not going to include all the other cards in our benchmarks for this one. We obviously have other data, but you can look at previous benchmarks for that. This is so focused solely on the 1650 cards and just the non-super SKUs. So one of these is G6, one's G5. They're otherwise the same. Uh, we bought an EVGA SKU from Newegg, and uh, our previous SKU is a GDDR5 EVGA SC Ultra from the original review cycle. The biggest question here, again, is to set the clocks equal to each other. This is pretty easy, and we'll show you a frequency plot in the first set of charts to illustrate what we did to, to do that. And separately, uh, the next thing we want to look at, other than just G5 versus G6 performance on the same GPU, obviously stock to stock matters too, because most people aren't going to normalize the clocks. They're going to plug it in and forget about it. Pricing's about the same. The original card, the GDDR5 1650, which we said was dead on arrival, was priced at $170 at the time we reviewed it, and it's still about that price. It's $150 to $170 on average for a G5 version. The GDDR6 version is about $160 to $170. Uh, it has improved in performance. The 1650 Super was a pretty good card for the price. The 1650 was not well positioned at launch. Like we said, it was dead on arrival, and it remains poorly positioned once the 1650 Super came out and further buried it. So. It's still kind of where it was before the GDDR6 version. It's just that it's a bit better now, but we don't necessarily recommend buying it. Actually, we don't really recommend buying it if you can spend a little bit more for something else. Anyway, that's a discussion you can watch in our GTX 1650 Super Review. For this one, we'll talk about these two cards specifically. There's a couple of other things to cover here, but we'll throw that in the conclusion. So let's just get straight into the benchmark since this one's so simple. We need to first establish the frequency at which the cards run, because any like-for-like -like comparison will be made more difficult by different core clocks. We're not intending to compare the core clock change here. We want to compare the memory change, so equalizing for frequency is a must. We'll also have benchmarks with the stock-to-stock -stock card performance, of course, just because that's probably how most people will be using it. We're using times by GT1 and GT2 for this frequency chart with a gap in between them. The GDDR5 original model ran at about 1950 MHz flat for the GPU core frequency. It started at 1980 and then dropped to 1950 for the rest of GT1. For GT2, the GDDR5 model ran at about 1950 MHz when stock, with a dip to 1930 towards the end. Running stock, the GDDR6 model has more trouble holding a hardline frequency, but tends to hold at about 1905 MHz. That 45 MHz deficit is important and needs to be corrected for in any like-for-like -like comparison with just the memory change being tested. With a 40 MHz offset and a plus 3% increase in power budget, we were able to hit the frequencies and manually align them. The GDDR6 card's extremely slight overclock, if you can even call it that at these numbers, held about 1950 MHz. It's still plus or minus 10 MHz peak to peak, but overall it's much closer and close enough that we can call them about the same for this one-off test. 3 Mark Time Spy gives us some useful scoring that can be more reliable in establishing deltas in the memory performance. GT1 and GT2 are split out in a way that we can better understand what each test is doing. They isolate for 
memory or for core. So that's useful in a synthetic fashion. For this one, the GTX 1650 with GDDR5 scored 19.6 FPS GT2 average when stock, while the stock G6 card with its core frequency deficit included scored 22.2 FPS. And that's an increase of 13.3% from the G5 to the G6 card. That's without even equalizing the frequency. GT1 posted a difference of 21.5 to 24.9, or a 15.6% difference. Although not shown here because it blew out the scale, the scoring was 3361 points versus 3851 points on the G6 card, if you care, or 3900 points with the G6 card with the core clocks equalized. The GDDR6 card's GPU frequency set approximately the same, about 1950 MHz, resulted in 22.51 FPS for GT2 and 25.24 FPS for GT1. As a note, every fraction of a frame in TimeSpy is important to scoring. It's not like a game where it'd be totally irrelevant. It's harder to gain those fractions of a frame in this benchmark than in game benchmarks. The GDDR6 clock controlled test puts it at a massive 17.2% ahead of the G5 card at the same clocks but we should test some other games to get a more real-world representation. For F1 at 1080p, the stock GDDR5 test ran 62 FPS average, 35 FPS 1% low, and 18.4 FPS 0.1% lows, representing the frame times. The stock GDDR6 card improved this result by about 5% while running at lower core clocks, demonstrating the benefit of the GDDR6 memory upgrade. Matching the core clocks together pushes that by an additional 3.5% to 67.5 FPS average, with the low results within test error. The improvement at roughly the same core clock, but with GDDR6, is about 9% over the original GDDR5 card. At 1440p, that difference is about 8.8% between the matched core result and the stock GDDR5 result, at 50.6 FPS average to 46.5 FPS average. The GDDR6 stock card ran at 48.8 FPS average, maintaining a rough 5% advantage as seen at 1080p. We run multiple resolutions to see if there's any scaling across them as the workload shifts, so next we'll look at 4K, despite it being completely unreasonable for these cards. At 4K, the improvement continues to shrink. We're down from 9% at 1080p to 8.2% at 4K, measured between the GDDR5 stock card and the GDDR6 card with the matched core frequency. The GDDR6 card is about 4.9% ahead, so not much has really changed here. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is next, starting again at 1080p. For this test, the GTX 1650 with GDDR5 ran at 52 FPS average versus 56 FPS on the G6 stock model. That's an increase of 8.7%, and that's in spite of the decrease in core clocks on the G6 stock model. Matching the frequency got it to 57 FPS average, so not much change and within run-to-run -run variation of the stock G6 test. The matched core difference ends up being about 9.8% from G5 to G6, which is similar to the 9% improvement we saw in the previous game benchmark. Moving on to 1440p to check for scaling, the matched core difference between G5 and G6 ends up at about 11%, so it has increased with the higher resolution. That makes sense in memory intensive scenarios like this one. If you were to just buy the card and use it out of box, like most people would do, the difference is still 9.3% between the 37.7 FPS and 34.5 FPS average results. And we didn't run this one in 4K because it became too stuttery even for synthetic analysis. GTA 5 showed a bigger change. We retested this one to validate and came up with the same results. At 1080p, the GTX 1650 G5 card scored almost exactly the same as it did in our initial review, illustrating why we like keeping GTA around on the bench. It's consistent and it's reliable even across five years of testing. That makes it easier to fact check against older data. For scaling, the clock matched 1650 G6 held 71 FPS average, a marked lead at 12.5%. That's the biggest in-game increase we've yet monitored. The stock-to-stock -stock test also showed an improvement at 70.6 FPS average versus the original 63. Although not shown on this chart, just for reference, the 1650 Super card runs this game at about 83 FPS average, so the gap has narrowed between the 1650 SKUs. At 1440p, the 1650 G5 to G6 gap increases to 14.4% on the matched core result, or about 11.4% from stock to stock, or out of box performance. The increase in resolution has increased the bandwidth requirement, and that's reflected positively with the jump to GDDR6. We'd expect that continue with 4K, 
as the bandwidth requirement increases even further. In this instance, it's at 15.7% improved from GDDR5 to GDDR6 with matched core clocks, or 12.9% if you look stock to stock, where the G6 card is running at a slower core frequency. We know no one is going to play with these settings or at these frame rates, but the point is to illustrate the scaling under heavier memory load conditions and under higher strain on the bus. The next title is Hitman 2 with DX12 enabled. For this one, we get the opposite. Not every game cares as much about memory bandwidth, and Hitman 2 is one of them. In this title, we're more limited by the reduced SM count than we are by the memory, at least when benchmarked with these settings. The GTX 1650s are maximally 5.4% apart, back to the original numbers we saw in F1. 1440p shows the same thing. The maximum top to bottom difference is 5.5%, functionally unchanging from the 1080p deltas. This is a game that doesn't care much about the memory bandwidth between these specific cars. That doesn't mean it doesn't care in general about memory bandwidth, just between these 1650 models where they're going to be limited by something else in the core first. Just to really illustrate that point, even 4K proves this. We measured a 5.4% delta top to bottom at 4K resolution, and the stock to stock results aren't that different either. This is a big difference from what we saw in GTA 5. Just for sanity, we also ran Hitman 2 with DirectX 11. In this version of the benchmark, the results posted an 8.5% increase in performance from the GDDR5 1650 to the G6 1650. The two GDDR6 cards were about the same, given the small change in clocks, but the memory difference still benefited the new card in a measurable way, although maybe not a meaningful one. For purely synthetic reasons, we also included an Ashes of the Singularity Escalation run at 4K. This is a DirectX 12 benchmark, as are some of the previous tests, and it's one that is useful for straining cards, kind of like Time Spy is. In this one, our maximum difference was at 9.1% from top to bottom, at 28.2 FPS average versus 25.9 FPS average for the G5 card, both at the same clocks. The stock-to-stock -stock comparison still plots a 7% performance increase from the memory, even with the clock deficit on the core. The last chart is a quick power test. We took power consumption at the PCIe slot and at the PCIe 12 volt cables with a custom interposer and with hardware monitoring. The stock GTX 1650 with GDDR5 drew about 84 watts in Fermark, compared to about 86.4 watts with the G6 card. This is within tolerance of potential error or test variance. It was about 91 watts when they were clock matched, so there is an increase. The time spy numbers were about 10 watts different between the two cards. More interestingly, we noticed that the PCIe slot only ran about 12 watts for the 12 volt lines when tested for the GDDR5 card, while the power was balanced evenly with the PCIe slot and the cable for the GDDR6 card. It was a difference of one amp on the original to a split of 3.4 to 3.8 amps on each of the PCIe slot and cable for the newer card. NVIDIA is well within the slot spec, but it still saw a power consumption increase on the PCIe slot and a decrease on the cables to accommodate the newer memory, it seems. Okay, so that'll recap it for those. The most interesting finding here, although not particularly useful in any way, is just that the power consumption seems to be more evenly split between PCIe on the motherboard and PCIe in the cables. And we measured the 12 volt lines on the PCIe slot and then obviously the, the power connector. So that doesn't have any implications of anything. It just means that it's more evenly distributed. Why? We're not really sure. It's something with how the power delivery is set up, but it's not exceeding the power consumption limitations in either connector. So, uh, and it's not really that different in power consumption than originally. At most, we're seeing 10 watts difference in some workloads. So it's not that different in, in any power consumption metric. It's uh, better in performance. It's in some cases a significant uplift. We had a couple of other games too that we tested where we were seeing some of the higher numbers like we saw towards the 14% marker, but um, that's about the most you can expect out of it. So a big jump, yes, and definitely worth the upgrade if uh, you had to buy it new today. Obviously, you shouldn't be upgrading your 1650 GDR5 model to a G6 model. That's a waste of money. Also, in general, we don't think you should really be buying a GTX 1650. It's not, it's not an objectively bad card in that it does not have any flaws in uh, basic operation. <laughs> but it is a comparatively bad card in that it's a bad deal when you look at even NVIDIA's own offering. 1650 Supers are much more worth it even with the, the performance increase that these got. And the reason NVIDIA brought the clocks down a bit was to try and mitigate that 
performance increase so that they didn't cannibalize their own SKU. Uh, the closest AMD competitor would be the 5500 XT or something like that, but that one had a bit of a troubled launch. So uh, yeah, it is improved, but otherwise remains about where we thought. If you're going to buy one, then definitely get the GDDR6 version. Don't buy the GDDR5 version. It is a meaningful improvement. Uh, you shouldn't just kind of brush it off as a small change. It's a big change here. And in some games, it's only 5%, but in a good amount of them, we're seeing 10% or so, or more. There is one complaint I want to point out, because we're not going to do a separate teardown on these, but the uh, EVGA card, at least, the one that we picked up, it does not have any memory cooling whatsoever. So EVGA says it technically operates in spec. We believe them. It probably does technically operate within spec. But GDDR6 is pretty hot. And even just, oh, just like, they have other coolers. It's a down costing thing, but this is one of those things where as reviewers who work with a lot of cards, we don't really feel comfortable down costing in some areas. And one of those would be memory cooling because long-term use, I don't know, you don't know what kind of system the user is putting it in. A lot of people have hot cases. They run hot configurations because they're not really built in a way that's mindful of thermals and now you have absolutely nothing to fall back on for the memory except for the fan. And here's the problem with a GPU that's well cooled or is low power consumption. When the GPU is low power consumption and is well cooled, the fan on the card is following that behavior. It's not aware of the GDDR6 thermals. On, at least on NVIDIA cards, there's no, they don't program it that way. The fan is programmed to follow the GPU temperature. And uh, so because of that, if you have a GPU that's particularly cool, but you have a heavy memory workload and in a warm case, you're going to end up with a situation where the fan's not spinning quite fast enough uh, to cool the memory adequately. Now, in this card, truthfully, it probably does perform within spec, but it's just not, not the kind of thing that we're really comfortable with seeing a complete down costing of. In the very least, connect the memory to the rest of the cooler that's used for the GPU it will, uh, quote unquote, increase the GPU temperature because you're sharing that cold plate, that cooling solution with more components that are higher power consumption, obviously, uh, total going into the cold plate, that is. But it'll be better for the overall system and it's a bit more metal. So, I mean, what are you talking, $5 to the end user? It just, it seems like the kind of thing that shouldn't really be left out. But anyway, that's a complaint about the card. Uh, G6 has improved over G5, that's all you need to know. And now you know the exact degree to which it has improved. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And we'll see you all next time.